This is the Neurovisor light and sound device that claims to improve your learning, memory, focus, productivity, and overall brain health with sessions to be as little as 11 minutes per day. The experience is really fun. It produces these geometric patterns that you can see through your eyelids with your eyes closed during the session that are really quite psychedelic and entertaining. But I wasn't sure if it was actually doing anything for my brain because we never talked about devices like this in medical school or in my military residency training to become a medical doctor. Over the last couple of months, I've seen a lot of these devices hitting the market, and I think a lot of people are confused. What do these things actually do for your brain? Why would you get one? So I decided to get the Neurovisor a few weeks ago, and I was really surprised how I felt after the sessions. I felt really awake and productive after a morning boost session, for example, but still I didn't have any data to know if it was actually doing something to my brain. Then I thought, why don't I just record my brainwaves with the Muse headband before, during, and after the Neurovisor sessions, and then get some neuroscience friends to weigh in and use some AI tools like ChatGPT to decode the brainwaves and see if I can pull out any data and biomarkers that might shed some light on what's going on in my brain here. In this video, we'll be taking a close look at this Neurovisor device and reviewing my brainwave results that I recorded using the latest gold standard research in mind. Because there's some really amazing research coming out of MIT that suggests that light and sound devices like the Neurovisor may be able to prevent and treat memory issues like in Alzheimer's disease. But the question is, can I demonstrate any of that in my home studio here? So let's take a closer look at the Neurovisor and see how that might actually be done. Right off the bat, we see this really sleek LED panel design that has a satisfying magnetic clip to the headband that you strap on for sessions. I was excited to find that the light panel does not even need to be connected to the head strap to work. You can just mount it on an iPad stand in front of you if you want. And that really came in handy for me when I didn't want to strap two different devices to my head for the brainwave experiments. Another great feature about this is the panel is pretty light. It's not too heavy, which is important for comfort because you wouldn't want like a big battery hanging from your head that would get uncomfortable over time. Norvisor has a lot of different settings for relaxation, sleep, and boosting your energy in the mornings. The app is very modern and professional, and I found the Bluetooth connection to be absolutely seamless. And it's great that you can adjust the light intensity so that the brightness is at a comfortable level. I'm more of a morning person, so I was really excited to try the upbeat setting first thing in the morning, and I found the music really motivating. And the light show is really amazing. They put a ton of work into this with all kinds of swirling and twirling patterns that are totally captivating. It was creating light tunnels and mind spaces that remind me of meditation and psychedelic experiences. And subjectively, I really honestly felt happy at the end of the session. And after the morning session, I would then switch into my data analysis and script writing for the day. And I don't know if I was just excited about this video or the data that I was getting out of Neurovisor, but I was totally locked into flow state after using the upbeat light stimulation patterns. In the past, I really was skeptical about these light and sound devices because we never learned about them in my formal psychiatry training. And I've never seen anything FDA approved for specific diseases like depression or Alzheimer's disease by using this mechanism of flashing lights. Now, I did see a lot of research during my residency training on these seasonal affective disorder lights that you can just order off Amazon. They don't pulse or anything. It's just light exposure that you give yourself first thing in the morning. And there's a lot of evidence on that for setting your circadian rhythm. It's been popularized by scientists like Andrew Huberman lately. But when you look at the cost of that, Sunlight's generally free, or if it's winter time or cloudy, you can use one of these seasonal affective disorder lights to get light exposure first thing in the morning. So I'm sitting here thinking, is there really any scientific validity for these flickering lights that tend to be more expensive? So I started to dive into the research and found that there's some amazing work coming out of MIT in this area in the last eight years. Today, over 6 million people in the US currently have Alzheimer's dementia. That means they reach the threshold of symptoms to be diagnosed with the disease. Unfortunately, many of us that don't even qualify for that diagnosis still develop some symptoms of mild cognitive impairment as we age and we get into the elderly years. Many of you probably have parents and grandparents that are starting to show these symptoms to include memory loss, confusion, and impaired reasoning. I know I've witnessed my grandparents develop some of these symptoms. Now, scientists have known for a long time that there's this accumulated material in the brain called beta amyloid plaques that build up with age and is closely related to Alzheimer's disease. 
Back in 2016, researchers at MIT were totally stunned to find that if they took mice that were developing Alzheimer's and flashed light in their eyes at 40 hertz oscillation frequency, which is in the gamma range, it actually turned on the mouse's immune system within their central nervous system, which started to clear out those plaques and the mice even started to show improvement in cognitive performance and memory. If you wanna take a look at those studies, there is a link in the description of this video. MIT continued to reproduce those results, and now there's even a spin-off company called Cognito that is going through a lot of research in preparation for the FDA trials. They created a light stimulation device that flashes in gamma 40 hertz frequency in hopes to activate the brains of human Alzheimer's patients so that the beta amyloid plaques can be removed and their cognitive performance can improve. And they're having some exciting initial results in the human clinical trials. Now, let me be clear, the Neurovisor device has not been approved for prevention or treatment of Alzheimer's, but unfortunately, time has run out for a lot of people, and the rest of us need to start doing what we can to prevent the accumulation of these beta amyloid plaques over time. So I'm really excited to see Cognito come out at some point, but right now there are other devices that we could be using to theoretically turn on the immune system of our brains. And Neurovisor has a lot of stimulation patterns that include the gamma 40 hertz frequency stimulation. And I'm not saying that Neurovisor will prevent dementia, but I am saying there's a lot of similarities between what Neurovisor is doing and what theoretically the Cognito device would be doing. Now, the main side effect to be careful about is if you have a history of epilepsy or seizures, this could induce seizures if you're prone to them, so be really careful with that. Otherwise, there really is not too many side effects to worry about other than maybe a headache if you've got the light intensity up too high but you can easily adjust that on the app. All right, so now let's take a look at the data that I collected and see how Neurovisor actually affected my brain here in the studio. Now, the only way that we can actually measure beta amyloid plaques is in post-mortem autopsy. And since I'm not ready to cut open my brain to see if there's any plaques in there, what we can measure are my brain waves. There's a lot of evidence that beta and gamma waves in the brainwave spectrum are decreased in Alzheimer's patients, so I wanted to see if Neurovisor would affect those brainwave frequencies. For simplicity, I decided to go with the Muse headband, which has two forehead and two behind the ear brainwave sensors through a process called electroencephalography, otherwise known as EEG. There is a third party app called Mind Monitor that allows me to record my brain waves through the Muse headband while doing the Neurovisor stimulation. I can then take those raw brainwave files and create graphs or even have them analyzed by ChatGPT to pull out different biomarkers from the data. There are different frequencies of brainwaves we'll take a look at. Slower frequency brainwaves like delta and theta are most prominent during sleep and drowsiness. Alpha is a bit higher during relaxed focus and meditation. And beta and gamma are the most important today for decision-making, memory, and cognitive flexibility. The beta and gamma are what we're really watching today. Scientists have known for years that beta and gamma brainwaves tend to be lower in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Theoretically, a 40 hertz stimulation stroboscopic device like the one coming out of MIT could activate the immune system and clear out the beta amyloid plaques, but also encourage the brain into higher beta and gamma brainwave frequency patterns. So the first two measures I'll be looking at in my brainwave data will be beta and gamma, but I also wanted to look at the supposed psychedelic properties proposed on the Neurovisor website. There's been a lot of news recently about how the psychedelic ketamine is now FDA approved for the treatment of major depressive disorder, and psilocybin from magic mushrooms has been shown to have dramatic evidence for improving depression in cancer patients. Now on the website, Neurovisor claims that its effects are similar to quote unquote microdosing psychedelics, but I'm wondering if there's really any scientific validity to that. Several weeks ago, when I first saw this device, it reminded me of a study poster that my friend, Dr. Nico Regente had posted from the Institute of Advanced Consciousness Studies in Santa Monica. They had been using a stroboscopic light device similar to Neurovisor and measuring something called EEG entropy, which is a measure of the randomness of the EEG brainwave signals. Researchers have found over the past 10 years that people who take psychedelics present with more random signals in their EEG and brain blood flow patterns as if the medicines were randomizing their brain activity. Some people believe that this has to do with opening up their mind to be more flexible and perceive things outside of normal human consciousness, maybe think about things in different ways, which can be important for depression treatment. So I reached out to Nico, who directed me to the lead researcher on the study, Dr. Joel Freilich.
The way the study with IACS is set up is, you know, we partnered with Intu, which has their own patented device for stroboscopic stimulation. We looked at permutation entropy with five different time lags, okay? And at the, the faster time scales, which, yeah, like, very roughly might be something like 10 to 40 hertz, there we see the increase in entropy. So Nico and Joel found that the stroboscopic light actually induces increased entropy in the EEG signals. Now, these are pretty complex calculations, so I was curious if ChatGPT would even be able to perform these on the data that I collected from the Muse headband while doing the Neurovisor sessions. I recorded my brainwave activity for 11 minutes before, during, and after the Neurovisor stimulation. You can see quite clearly here that there is an increase in beta and gamma activity during and slightly after the stimulation from Neurovisor. So that confirms my suspicions there. Neurovisor actually does increase beta and gamma waves in my brain. Then I loaded the raw brainwave files into ChatGPT and asked it to measure the EEG entropy. We used a specific type of entropy measurement called permutation entropy that takes time samples from the data and measures the amount of order and disorder in the signal. I found that there was increased entropy in the EEG signals, especially when we used it on the gamma gamma setting on the neurovisor that has many of its stimulation frequencies right around 40 Hertz, which is the same stimulation frequency described in the MIT studies. So to recap all of this, I found that Neurovisor increases the beta and gamma waves in my brain during its light stimulation at 40 Hertz, which has been found in other research to clear beta amyloid plaques in rat models and improve cognition in human trials. And Neurovisor also increased the permutation entropy in my brainwave signals, which is an effect commonly seen in someone who takes psychedelics, some of which are being used to treat depression in clinical settings. These results were really exciting, but there's a lot of work that I need to do to refine my methods. There were definitely some challenges and limitations to these methods. It's really hard to tell what pre-processing is done to the mind monitor data to filter out noise in the data set. And I'm working on getting more information on that. Here on Tech for Psych, we might actually be getting a workaround for that soon. I'm developing some software with my developer to create a custom chat GPT that we can use for Muse data analysis. But for now, with these methods, noise could definitely alter the results. So it's important for me to be incredibly still when I'm recording the EEG data and just keep that in mind when I'm trying to interpret the results and continue to refine my methods over time. Another challenge is that the data files from Mind Monitor have too many data tokens for ChatGPT to just analyze the whole file in one go. So I had to actually have ChatGPT analyze only one electrode location at one brain frequency within a limited time point, one by one by one, where it actually uses Python to pull out the necessary data and be able to make those calculations one by one. Otherwise, it just gets overwhelmed and there's an analysis error. I'm really looking forward to the day where they allow us to use more data tokens in one go. Now, Dr. Joel said that my methods were not unheard of, so it's not completely out in left field what I'd done, but ideally the analysis would be done on raw EEG before it was broken down into the different frequency bands. But EEG entropy is such a new and emerging field, there's actually a lot of different ways to do it. Also, Dr. Joel said that the largest effects that they found was in the occipital lobe on the back of your head, which makes sense because that's where visual information is interpreted. Unfortunately, the Muse doesn't have any occipital sensors. The closest you can get is the sensors that go behind your ears in the temporal parietal region. It would have been nice to measure what was going on on the back of my head, and I can do that with the Neurosity Crown, but recently I broke my Neurosity Crown during travel. It broke in the suitcase when I went to Austin, Texas to record at Soundshed Studios. So I really need to get a Neurosity crown replacement to do more experiments with. And overall, I'd say the Muse data is actually easier to load up into ChatGPT right now. I just have a good workflow for that. So there was a convenience factor there as well. Overall, I was just really impressed that ChatGPT even attempted to do these calculations in the first place. And it was really cool to see those increased entropy values on the gamma gamma setting with the Neurovisor and also see an increase in beta and gamma on the upbeat setting. There is so much going on here with potential dementia prevention and even psychedelic effects. We know that certain psychedelics like ketamine are FDA approved for major depressive disorder. Now, just because it does similar things to the brain in relation to permutation entropy, doesn't mean that it has the exact same effect, but I think it's interesting that there's a correlation. And the same goes for the gamma 40 Hertz stimulation studies out of MIT. Neurovisor has some stimulation frequencies at the 40 Hertz frequency, but it also layers a lot of slower frequencies in to create more of that fun psychedelic geometric experience. 
And I did notice that the Cognito trials are doing an hour of stimulation a day instead of the 11 minutes with the Neurovisor. I have to hand it to the Cognito team for doing all the gold standard research right now for FDA approval. But at the end of the day, that device just isn't available to us right now. Neurovisor's not going through FDA trials, but I will say that my initial skepticism about this technology making any impact on the brain is a lot less after doing this research and seeing the data for myself. It does seem to justify why you would get a more expensive strobing light device over some other light stimulation options on the market currently that don't have the potential 40 hertz stimulation or permutation entropy effects on your brain waves. The Neurovisor comes in at $500 and I do think that that cost is justified for someone who's getting really serious about their brain and mental health and want to do so in a fun and engaging way that's quite passive but also very enjoyable. They were nice enough to give me a discount code for the Tech for Psych audience, so there are affiliate links in the description below if you want to get a discount and help support this channel. It really helps a lot. And if you want to see how Neurovisor compares to some of the other light flashing devices that are flooding the market right now in light of all this new research, click this link here and I'll see you on the other side.